morning, dear parents and prospective students. Welcome to the virtual info day for Foundation in Science IMU by Dr. James Edward Walsh, the head of Center for Pre-University Studies. First, let me walk you through the housekeeping rules to ensure that this talk uh, goes on smoothly. First, we have muted the microphone for participants. For Q&A and feedback, please use the Q&A panel. Thirdly, this live talk will be recorded for your further reference. Hence, without further ado, let's invite Dr. James for his talk. Dr. James? Thank you, Kenna, uh, for that nice introduction. Can you see my slides, Kenna? Yes, Dr. James. Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for giving us your time on this Saturday morning during MCO. Uh, we've done a number of these broadcasts that replace our normal face-to-face. But hopefully by the time you as students uh, join IMU, the MCO is over and the vaccine is beginning to kick in. Uh, as Kenneth says, I'm the head of pre-university studies. I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a physics doctor. So I teach physics and computer science on the course. I've been in the Malaysian uh, education sector, particularly in pre-university studies for eight years. Um, and I... Uh, I also do some research in the university and have a management job. So I have multiple roles, but I do teach on the course and I enjoy teaching the foundation students enormously. So without further ado, I think you've been, the um, brochure has been shared with you. So I won't go through the brochure in enormous detail. We will refer to it for Q and A later, but I'll just quickly go through the key points. I, in, in online seminars, usually a brief talk and then a more rigorous Q and A works better. Foundation in Science is a one-year program, so it's a pre-university course that is parallel to, say, A-levels or IB or OSMAT, and it gets you from SPM or IGCSE equivalent into the first year of your degree. Now, it's one year, so you're going to do that syllabus, syllabus equivalent A-level in, in a year, which is kind of less than A-levels, but it's a much broader syllabus. But you're choosing this pathway because it's the most direct pathway from school to your degree. So you've made a choice, you want to engage in the rigors of foundation, and you want to make it get onto your degree within a year of leaving school and get your career on its, on its path. The other aspects of foundation that make it different from say A-levels, and A-levels is excellent obviously, is there's three semesters with five subjects. So there's in total, there's the five subjects per semester. So in total, there's 15 subjects. So in addition to the core biology, chemistry, maths, etc., we teach a lot of soft skills. So we teach you to be a broad-based student so you can better engage in your undergraduate program later on when you join medicine or dentistry, pharmacy, or biomedical sciences, or Cairo. So we try and teach you to be a self-learning student. So there's core science and professional modules. It's also 50% continuous assessment and 50% exam. I'll repeat this concept throughout the talk. This is very important. If you do a pre-U like A-level uh, and it suits your style of learning, you study hard for a period of up to two years, depending on uh, how you do it. And you, um, you do a large set of exams at the end. In foundation, the same information is divided up into smaller chunks and subdivided into assessments. So there's ways to manage and compensate for any errors you might make. And we do a lot of mentoring to support you. There's also a 100% bursary for students with a certain number of A's in their IGCSE or SPM and also scholarships. And foundation students are very successful in getting scholarships for undergraduate. It doesn't mean they're favored by the university over other students coming from um, other pre-U courses. It just means we've taught them to do well at the scholarship interviews and they're more self-confident and typically more mature. So there are 12 IMU health science degree options and our partner track and direct entry to other universities. So, I, so foundation science qualifies you for all of these. Parents frequently ask me if I change my mind and I want to do something else like an arts-based course or maybe engineering, or even do medicine in another university, we prefer you to say an IMU obviously, can I use my foundation in science course to take a pathway out of IMU to another university and another discipline? Generally speaking, yes. It depends on the discipline, but we have 
students every year who go and do uh, other courses, other disciplines, and also are now beginning to apply for direct entry to international universities using the foundation course. But of course, acceptance is not guaranteed. It's, be it's a negotiation between you and that university. However, if you're staying in IMU and or you're joining our partner track, then foundation is the bespoke course for you. It's the best pathway. Another key point is progression. How many students who join foundation make it into the undergraduate programs in IMU? And currently the target we're achieving is 85%. So of all the students who join on day one, when you join on day one, we ask you, what's your undergraduate first choice? Medicine. Second choice, maybe dentistry. Third choice, biomedical science. And you can change those choices at any time throughout the course. 85% of students make it to their first, second, or third choice. Some even have a fourth choice. It doesn't mean you're guaranteed. It doesn't mean we contrive to make it 85%. The quality of the teaching from my colleagues, like Miss Kanaga, who teaches biology, and the quality of the mentoring and support means that you have an 85% of chance of making it. So it's up to you, hard work, your own intellect, which we know because you come in with your grades from IGCSE and SPM, and the support of the teachers and the excellent teaching and foundation. It's the preferred entry to IMU degrees. So what does that mean? It means that while you're in foundation in semesters one and two, you will get briefings from our undergraduate programs. The professors from all of the degrees, biomedical science, complementary medicine, medicine itself, pharmacy, will give you briefings when it's face-to-face -face teaching, when hopefully MCO ends their activities, laboratory-based fun activities, we call them look, see, feel. So you can get a clear understanding of what your undergraduate choice is all about. And if you think that you may have made a mistake, oh, I didn't realize that this is what a doctor does, then you can go to the dentistry ones or the pharmacy ones and see what alternatives you have. So by the time you reach semester three, You've got your grades for semesters one and two. You can then apply for your chosen degree in IMU while you're in semester three. You do not have to wait until you're complete your semester three. This is important because if you join the April 2021 intake, then you will be, some of you will join the February slash April 2022 intake of, say, medicine. So you don't have to wait till your final exams are all completed to discover if you have a seat. If your grades are sufficient after semester two, you can apply, usually in November, December. The FS120 last year's April intake have just completed their semester two exams, and they're beginning to apply for the, their degrees now in the early part of 2021. You can secure your place. You can do your MUIT exam or your, whatever English test you're taking. You can do your interview for medicine or dentistry. So it means you have an advantage over external pre-U students. Providing your CGPA is sufficient, um, we will, you can get there ahead of the competition. So this is the advantage, and this is why we call it preferred entry. Also, if there was a, only one place remaining, let's say in dentistry, and you were competing for that place with an external A-level student, with whom you had a similar grading, you were a similar banded student, let's say band one or band two, you had all A's or A minuses. For the final place, the deans of the respective faculties will generally favor the foundation students over the external students. So we do tend to favor our foundation students, providing your grade is sufficient. So back to the program structure, three semesters, five subjects in each semester, core science, chemistry, biology, maths, lesser amount of physics. It's applied biophysics that I teach. So to teach students why physics is important in health sciences. And in semester three, we have electives, which can be directed towards your final degree or support you in your, in your knowledge for your final degree choice. So for example, chemistry and biosciences are useful for medicine and uh, dentistry. Psychology, obviously, if you want to do psychology, but it's also important for medicine as well. And statistics, some of you are very good at maths, so you can do very well in statistics and it can boost your CGPA. But also in this time of COVID and all of the information and the epidemiology and the patient statistics, statistics is a very important program for doctors at the moment, because epidemiology is all statistics. So they're all relevant. The end of semester one, you do an exam 
end of semester two, you do an exam, and semester three, you do an exam. So you gradually build up your final CGPA. So for example, let's say semester two, you found tough and you didn't get the grade you were hoping for. You got 3.4 and the intended grade for medicine is 3.5. Pick it up in semester three, work hard, get say 3.6 CGPA in semester three, and you can compensate for maybe a semester where you got a slightly lower grade than you expected. And the management of this education and your grades with a view to getting into your chosen degree is a key part of the mentoring of the Foundation in Science course. When your grades come out for exams and the assessments during the semester, your mentor will talk to you about the grades, see if you're on target. If you're off target, if you're getting a B instead of an A, how are you going to improve? If, you're, if you find that you're constantly getting grades below the target, what's plan B? What's your second degree choice? What are alternate academic pathways to the career you want? So there's lots of management by staff and lots of information, and it's a broad team of student affairs, uh, academic services, um, all of the faculties are involved. So all of the departments, academic and administrative in IMU are there to support you in your dream to get your ch to your chosen degree and start your career successfully. So these are some of the key factors we believe that leads to this, to this success. Well-designed curriculum, based on A-level. So you're, you're, you're acquiring the same information as A-level students who will be sitting in, say, medicine in year one. So you have no academic disadvantage, particularly in the area of core sciences. And you have a lot more soft skills, such as English, computing studies. You'll learn to write mobile apps, thinking skills, and community uh, work. Thorough exposure to degrees. I mentioned that you'll be in the university when we're back on campus or even off campus, and you'll have exposure to all the degrees. We have a buddy system of foundation students who are now in the undergraduate degrees who have got there via foundation. You can talk to them on the email and chat to them privately and find out how they got there and what the rigors of the undergraduate course are like and what to focus on maybe in terms of your electives. Pastoral care, I emphasize it again. Lots and lots of mentoring and support, particularly from the Foundation in Science staff, but also from all the other academic and administrative departments. A strong team of dedicated Foundation in Science lecturers. As I say, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm teaching you science that will help you become a doctor or a dentist or a pharmacist or a scientist. So the staff are, are expert in teaching science and English and other soft skills at foundation level. And foundation is a bridge between school-based learning and university-based learning. School-based being where the teacher tells you what to learn and undergraduate university where you find out what you have to learn with the support of your teachers. So we gradually try and change your mindset from a school-based mindset to a university-based mindset where you're independent self-learner. There's regulations and procedures and student handbooks that apply to both you, the students, and us, the staff. We can't change the rules halfway. Aligned teaching methodology with the way the undergraduate courses are taught. So we will begin to lecture you as opposed to teach you. Obviously, we will do both because you've just left school. But we will teach you to understand learning that's lectured, where you have to, you have to mine the knowledge and understand what's important. Uh, student life is very important. In this time of MCO, the, the important social dimension of university is somewhat lost. So we do try to have online activities, quizzes, orientation. The students themselves have gaming activities. But hopefully by next April, this won't be an issue and we'll, we'll be back on campus. So having a good work-life balance and a good social life, work hard, make friends, expand your knowledge, and expand your friendships. That's a key aspect of university. And if you're happy in university and you're happy in the environment, your grades will be good. If you're unhappy and the, the learning environment is not conducive to you, it may affect your grades and you need to talk to your mentor and figure out a way to um, embrace the environment you're in. IMU Cares is very important. We do a lot of community work because we're blessed to be in one of the leading universities in Southeast Asia, both the staff and students do a lot of support work for the community. We try and teach you a sense of responsibility going forward. And obviously, 
when you're being interviewed for, say, your medical degree, any community-based work that you did is important to show that you care and that you're an empathic human being. And we encourage continuous lifelong learning. I've been a professor now for many years, but I still learn something new every day. And my students sometimes tell me something that I don't know, even about physics. And I think that's great. If my students are smart enough to educate me, then as an educator, things are working well. I mentioned the coursework and semester exam being 50-50. If you work hard during the semester, do your mid-semester tests, your assignments, your laboratories for key subjects, your project work, you should go into the final semester exam with, let's say, a mark of at least 40 over 50. That's an A. So you've got a solid basis for getting a good overall grade in the semester. If you let your coursework slip, let's say in the worst case scenario, you get 20 over 50 because you haven't applied yourself. Um, you've built yourself a mountain to climb in the exams. You need to get a very high grade in exams. So again, we will teach you to manage your coursework monitor your grades and give you targets. So by the time you go to the end of semester exams, you have all your coursework grades, so you know what you need to aim for in the exam to get your desired final grade, which is hopefully an A. So there's lots of different styles of teaching. I mentioned self-directed learning, and we'll teach you to do that. Collaborative projects, working with your peers, Presenting and writing, oral skills and presentation skills. I mentioned before that foundation students do well in uh, scholarship interviews. So we do a lot of presentations, particularly in English. And the English courses like English and thinking skills are not just an add-on. They're very important. If your English skills are not good, then it will negatively impact your science skills, particularly in subjects like biology, where you have to do a lot of description. So English is very, very important. It's a tool to learning science and to learning health sciences going forward to your undergraduate degree. And then we have the continuous assessment. So the broad term for this is experiential learning. So we have class tests, the exams, practicals, reports, projects, presentations, lots of different ways for you to accumulate your grades, some of which you won't favor some of which you will, so you need to be strategic and figure out which are the ones you can score high on to maybe compensate for some of the types of assessments, tests and exams that you don't like. So if you don't like end of semester exams and you're not a great studier, make sure you get a very high grade in your assessment to give yourself a cushion. But obviously I encourage you to study hard for your end of semester exams. If you join our degrees, which I hope you do, for example, in medicine, it's a five-year course. You're going to have 10 semesters, some of which are assessment-based, some of which are exam-based, but assessments and exams are going to be coming at you hard and fast. So when you're in medicine, you need to be managing that. So we will teach you in advance of going to medicine to manage that. And if you talk to the buddies, they will reflect this. They will tell you that they were well prepared for the undergraduate degrees because we had taught them in foundation to manage all of the different types of learning and assessments as listed here. There are three intakes next year, April, July, and August. And these are aligned to the release of exam results, particularly in April. There's a bit of a question mark over the SPM at the moment. Uh, they will be released probably after April next year but um, where we are in negotiation with the ministry to see if we can take you based on forecast results. But either way, the July intake will be there for you. And then the August intake is for IGCSE students who get their uh, results um, just prior to that in July, but you can join any intake once you have your qualification. And they are aligned respectively to the intakes of our undergraduate programs. Most undergraduate programs have two intakes, usually in the first quarter of the year and the third quarter of the year. So typically April slash September. So you will aim to enter your undergraduate when you finish foundation. You don't necessarily have to go to the next intake of, of the undergraduate. You can wait six months if you choose. So it's the choice is yours. But you talk to your mentor, you talk to your parents, and you figure out the best route for you to your chosen intake of your chosen undergraduate course. So at the moment, we have about 400 students in foundation. This is our Facebook picture. Please engage in our Facebook page. 
the staff are here aligned at the front. So it's a team. It's a team of you, the students, the staff who are supporting and teaching and mentoring you and pushing you as well, and your parents who are making uh, an investment in your education and your future. So we all need to work together and work hard, but also, as is, as is evident from this picture on our Facebook page, it should be fun. It should be engaging. So our Facebook page has both social and academic elements to it. So please join it, both parents and students. Um, engage in it and like it, please. So some of the questions that may, I'll preempt some of the questions, but uh, you, you may wish to ask us about the entry requirements. They are in the Foundation in Science brochure. They change from time to time. For example, the entry requirement for medicine this time last year used to be a CGPA of 3.5. You can apply with 3.0 and above, but entry is not guaranteed. And you had to have a B in biology, chemistry, and maths or physics. The Medical Council have now changed that. You only need the uh, CGPA requirement. So all you need to do is make sure you pass the science subjects. But obviously, if you're aiming to get a high CGPA, you need to score high in the core subjects. Progression requirements. So what do you need to get into your degree? Apart from your grade, your MUIT, your SBM Bahasa, if you've done high GCSE, and so on and so forth. So we will inform you and my good colleagues in admissions and marketing will also inform you of the requirements and scholarships. What are the requirements for scholarships, both in foundation, the discount at the beginning, um, and then the progression scholarship. So if you progress into our degree, we, we give you back 50% of your fees that you paid. Um, if you have eight A's or eight A pluses or more in your IGC, SC or SPM, uh, then you get a 50% discount on your fees. So when you add this to the scholarship, foundation effectively becomes free of charge. Why do we do this? Because we want, it's a pathway to your degree. The point of coming to IMU is to get into your undergraduate and get your career kick-started. So ask questions on these subjects or any other you wish, and I'm always available. I'll give you my contact details at the end of this talk, and I will always reply to emails and messages that prospective parents and students uh, send me. And I'm happy to sit down and talk to you at a pre-arranged time, online obviously at the moment, but face-to-face -face when the MCO ends. So today is our virtual info day. Uh, you can go onto our site, mine all the information, ask questions on our, our talk to site. I'll be monitoring it during the day. So my colleagues, my good colleagues from foundation and marketing and other departments will be there answer your questions. I'm also happy to engage on a case-by-case -case basis. So thank you very much for listening. I hope it was clear. Sometimes we have Wi-Fi problems. Um, and maybe you want to snap this screen while it's on your computer or on your phone. My contact details are there and so are Canagas. Email is usually best because I have time to answer it in a detailed way. Sometimes if I get messages, I'm, I'm on the go and I don't know who's messaging me. So let me know who you are, what course you're interested in, what you're doing in, in school or have completed in school, SPM, IGCSE, and we will send you whatever information you wish, and so will my colleagues in marketing and uh, uh, admissions. So I will loop you in if you wish to talk to a professor from your chosen faculty, let's say chiropractic, and you want to know more about what the job prospects for chiropractors are at the moment in the Malaysian market or the Southeast Asian market, I can loop you in with my good colleagues in that uh, faculty and they can answer your questions. So you're about to make an investment in your future and your education, hopefully via IMU and IMU FIS. So information is important for this key investment and we'll provide you with what you need. Thank you for that, Kana. Okay, thank you, Dr. James, for the very detailed explanation. Uh, we have some Q&A on the I will address the first question for you. Has uh, any of your foundation students graduated with IMU degree? Yes. Okay, good question. Yes. Um, we have, I, uh, Foundation of Science has been in existence since uh, 2014, if I'm correct on that. Uh, so basically, we've been producing foundation students who are progressing to our degree for six years. So given that uh, some of our degrees are three years, some are four, medicine and dentistry are five, the answer is yes. 
and we last year one of the top dental students who graduated, uh, Sean. He's now doing his housemanship and he was a top foundation student from one of our first intakes and he came at or near the top of his class in dentistry and he's one of our ambassadors. So the foundation students are doing well. Okay. They're going out into the community. They're going on our partner tracks. Many of them are in Australia or the UK and we have buddies who are there. You can talk to them mm -hmm. and they're all doing fine. And we do keep in touch with our alumni. Um, so if you need to contact alumni, who were previously foundation science students, we can. We also have a lecturer in the chiropractic faculty mm -hmm. who was, who completed foundation in science, did our chiropractic course, and is now a teacher in the university. So yes, the answer is yes, and they are successful. Yeah, I think we also have Felicity who has joined UKM. Yes, would you yes. want to talk about her? Yeah. I forgot, yeah, Felicity yeah. was one of the first foundation students. She was before yes. my time, yes, but correct. she was a top student. She was president of the uh, Student Representative Council and an all-around great ambassador of IMU, completed medicine. And has she done her housemanship yet, Kenna? Yes, she, yes, she's in she, UKM at the moment. So she's actually, she's actually in UKM. So she's yeah. a graduated doctor. So if you yes. went to UKM, you would meet one of our former foundation right. students as a doctor there. And she's a great example of the kind of um, graduates of our degrees uh, who started off in foundation. Yes, correct. So I have another question from SM. Uh, if I do not have 5B for my SPM and I wish to join dentistry later on after foundation, is it possible? Um, you can join foundation and mm -hmm. you can, uh, but you must repeat your yeah. SPM the following year. So you will have registered soon after the results came out. And you must make sure and get that B before you join dentistry. So let's say you get the qualifying grade in foundation. Uh, let's say it's 3.5 for medicine, 3.8 for dentistry. Uh, so you're good to go with foundation, but you don't repeat your SBM, then you can't join until you get those five Bs. And that's not a requirement of IMU. They are requirements of the medical, dental, councils, yes. and pharmacy boards, respectively. So we have no control over them. So right. if you got a B in chemistry in your SPM, but you turn out to be a flat four student and a, the best student ever in, in FIS, you'll still be constrained by that B. I believe you can combine certificates. So you can combine some IGCSE and SPM mm -hmm. uh, if you've missed the SPM deadline, but there is a risk. So I would advise you to join with a view to doing dentistry, but have a plan B, a second undergraduate program that you may wish to join. So that if the SPM doesn't work out or you decide to change your mind, because you realize that let's say chemistry was your weakest subject, the one you didn't do well in SPM, and you talk to the buddies and find out that the chemistry in dentistry is quite difficult, uh, have a plan B. Another route you can take, and I'll be honest, is if you don't do foundation, but you do A-levels, then if you qualify for dentistry using your A-levels, I'm not sure what it is, I think it's three Bs at minimum in science subjects, um, then it doesn't matter what you got in your SPM or uh, O-level. It's only matriculacy and assassi and foundation that have the SPM O-level requirement. So you'll have to make that choice yourself, uh, but we will inform you fully and inform you of all the options. Okay, okay. okay, thank you, Dr. James. And we have another question by Krisha. Uh, what are the countries that recognize the degree of IMU? And she also has another question, uh, uh, Krisha. Okay. So which degree? The medical degree? Yeah, and she also asked, does all IMU students get to their housemanship at the new IMU hospital building? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So I'm not a medic, Krisha, so I'll just give you my informed decision. I would advise you to email me and I will pass on your question to um, Dr. Sunil or uh, Dr. Sue in medicine who can answer it, but I'll do it to the best of my ability. Um, the recognition of yeah. in Malaysian medical degrees, it depends on the medical council of the country concerned. So if you graduate as a Malaysian doctor and you want to go to my country, Ireland, and be a doctor there, then you need to do professional exams uh, in order to be allowed to practice there. And it depends on the country. If it's a country like the UK and to a lesser extent Ireland that have a demand for foreign doctors, they need doctors in their health service, um, it's relatively straightforward. 
if it's a country like the USA, where the education system is radically different, it can be more difficult. So it's on a case-by-case -case basis. But I believe there are some countries, and don't quote me on this, I think Sri Lanka might be one, where the IMU medical degree allows you to get off a plane in Colombo and be a doctor in Sri Lanka. I'd have to get the list from the medical faculty. Uh, what was ODA housemanship? Yes, yep. very important. Okay, so if you join a medical university in Malaysia, it's a key question. Will I get my housemanship? So all I can tell you is that uh, I am, the housemanship can take either six months or a year to get. IMU have been involved in these negotiations with, for housemanships with our respective hospitals for over 25, nearly 30 years. So we have a lot of experience in the sector. If you're a relatively young university who's only been graduating medical students for four or five years, then you're still developing these contacts. Most of our students get their housemanships quickly. It depends on where it's assigned. If you're assigned your housemanship uh, outstation um, in Perak or Perlis or East Malaysia, and you say, no, I want to do it in the Klang Valley, then it's going to take longer. Um, but generally speaking, the housemanship is not a problem. We haven't had a, to the best of my knowledge, we've never had a student who failed to get their housemanship. But again, that's also predicated on the sector as well. But IMU are pretty successful. In terms of our hospital, students will do clinical activities in our hospital, as far as I know, but it's not a public hospital, it's a private hospital. So to the best of my knowledge, you can't do your housemanship in a private hospital. Can I, maybe you can mm -hmm. confirm that. It has to be done in a public hospital. Public, correct. So the advent of the IMU hospital will just mean during your clinical years in medicine years, uh, three, four, five, you will have access to patients in, in our hospital. But you'll also be going to Seremban and uh, Pahang and all these places where we have other clinical facilities. I hope that answers your question. It's a yes. bit of a tricky one, but uh, if you want a more detailed answer, please contact us and we'll refer you to my medical contacts. Okay. Thank you, Dr. James. Okay. There's uh, one question from Ms. Chow. Uh, what are the other foundation courses that IMU accepts for their graduate programs, for the undergraduate programs? Oh, okay. okay. So um, IMU accepts all foundation courses. So if you go to another university and do foundation in science, it is accepted. Um, science only. The only undergraduate course in IMU that currently accepts art stream students who have general science in their SBM or IGCSE is psychology, I believe. We are starting a brand new course, a medical informatics course called Digital Health, which is a very exciting prospect. And we will be accepting art, students, art stream students onto that. That will be launched next year. Um, so Yes, we do accept foundation in science students from other courses and other universities. However, if, as I say, it's the final seat in your chosen degree, let's say it's dentistry, where there's a limited number of seats, and you're coming in um, from outside, from an outside foundation course, and you're competing for that seat with a foundation in science student from IMU who's similarly banded, has a similar grade profile, Admissions and the dean will generally favor the IMU foundation student for obvious reasons. Also, you get the progression scholarship. So you get 50% of your fees reverted back to you, whereas a student from outside will not get that. You'll have to pay the full fees for your foundation and science course. I hope that clarifies. Thank you, Dr. James. Next is from Kendra. This is actually about uh, scholarship application. Uh, 2018 result, SPM results accepted for scholarship application. Okay. The uh, requirement for the discount coming in, that's the 50% discount for eight A pluses, etc., uh, which I believe have been shared with you, that you must have done your SPM or IGCAC in the previous academic year. So those, the, those joining April, 2021 intake will have to have done their SPM or IGCSE this year. Obviously, SPM exams are delayed, but it's still the same thing still applies. Um, that is to favor students who have uh, recently completed and also to avoid some students who maybe have got multiple scholarships from multiple universities. So unfortunately, the terms and conditions laid down by admissions are that it only applies to those who did their um, IGCSE and SPM this year. However, the progression scholarship to the degree, the 50% discount for progressing into our degree, any degree, providing you have the qualifying CGPA, that still applies. 
So if you pay the full fees for foundation, 24,000, and then you progress into any of our degrees for which you're qualified, you don't have to get flat four or anything, providing you, 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 you enter, you have the minimum entry requirement and there's a seat on the course, then we will give you back 50% or 12,500 the discounted, prorated in your undergraduate fees. Okay, thank you, Dr. James. Uh, that's about Celine Chan. She's asking that the next intake is in April. So when would the last exam be? Okay, uh, good not, question. Yeah. So the the entry date for, let's say, medicine the following year is February 2022. So some students are saying, oh, I won't be finished foundation in time. Mm -hmm. That's not true. You will start with us in April. You will complete in March 2022, and you can join the first intakes of the degree program. They have started in February for external students. They do their government MPU subjects, but the medical, for example, or dental lectures or the Cairo lectures don't actually start until the beginning of April to allow the students from the April intake to go directly in. You also have the choice of taking a, a four or five month, month break and joining the August intake. So even though it looks like you can't make the February intake of 2022 for, let's say, medicine, it's not true. So we'll clarify that for you. So you can, if you join in April, you can basically enter any of the intakes in 2022, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. Thank you, Dr. James. Now, the next one is about PMS track. So what is the percentage of FIS students that successfully join PMS? Okay, good <laughs> question. I don't have the percentage, the, yeah. but um, I do have students. I need to I need to look into that information. When I first joined IMU, partner track didn't take foundation students because our international partners were unaware of what it was in terms of comparison to A-level. So one of my first jobs was to convince them of its academic merit. And we showed that they progressed through the degrees just as well as incoming A-level students. So to answer your question, the partner track is not an exact percentage. Typically, about 40% of students go on medical partner track. So that figure would then trickle down to the foundation students. Of the, 100 and, of the 200 students we enroll in medicine every year, typically 100 to 120 are currently foundation students and, and rising. It's almost a third of the students. So 40% of those have applied for and will hopefully go to PMS. But we don't know because it's not until two years. So when you apply for PMS, let's say you want to go to Warwick and Warwick offer 10 places for, for their partner track. When you join medicine, um, and you say, I want to put Warwick as my choice. If there's 11 students who've applied for the 10 seats in Warwick, the one with the lowest CGPA entering medicine uh, will be on the waiting list. If someone drops out, then you can join. So it's quite competitive. So the key to getting your partner track and guaranteeing your partner track is to max out your CGPA, get 3.7 and above. That's the, that's the thing. The key to partner is the CGPA because it's super competitive. Um, in terms of the breakdown details, I would then have to mine that information from the medical faculty because I don't know how many successfully go on, but we can try and find that for you if you wish. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. James, I hope that has answered the other student as well, Ms. Gill. Okay, uh, the next one that we have is similar questions from both um, Jun Hui and Ms. Hani. Uh, do all students have an SPM certificate in order to do housemanship in Malaysia? And the other has asked that uh, I have taken my IGCSE, so that is the similar question that we always get. Do yes. I need to take my SPM BM paper? Why? <laughs> Can okay. you please explain? <laughs> All okay. right. I will explain this. Um, this is not a question of academics. It's a question of politics. Okay. So I'll give you my best answer. The requirement to do your housemanship in dentistry or medicine or pharmacy in Malaysia is that you must have done SPM Bahasa. And the reason for this is no disrespect to IGCSE Bahasa, but the standard of SPM Bahasa is way higher. So you will be engaging with people. Um, on your housemanship, you may be in a hospital that's in a relatively um, economically disadvantaged part of Malaysia, and the people may not be that well off, and they may have zero English. So you need to be able to make a diagnosis and talk to them about their prescription if you're a pharmacist. So the, the government and the ministry and the respective councils and, and boards have decided that SPM Bahasa 
is the metric for this. So, and they have good reason for this. So the answer is, if you've done IGCSE and everything's good, if, and you're joined medicine or dentistry or pharmacy and you're progressing really well through those degrees, before you take your housemanship, you must enroll in the SPM exams. You must enroll for five subjects and you must take at least history and SPM as far as I'm concerned and get a passing grade in them. And until you do that, you cannot join your housemanship. If you're taking partner track and you're gonna graduate as a student, as a doctor in Australia or Ireland or England or Canada, etc., then you do not need to do that because you'll be doing your housemanship in those countries. However, if you then become a leading doctor in Ireland or Canada and become a world famous doctor, but you want to come back and practice medicine in Malaysia in 10 years time, you will still have to do SPM Bahasa under the current rulings. Uh, I hope that clarifies the situation. All right. Thank you, Dr. James. Next is from Mark. And honey, I think we'll answer both of them. Um, so I else can I, can I, your, uh, you're, you're beginning to lag a little bit. Uh, can you hear me now, Dr. James? Can, yeah. Ah, okay, so uh, this question is from Marcus and Hani. Yeah? Will it ever occur that the examination timing for SPM and IELTS clash with the assessment of IMU? And Hani is also asked, uh, when is it best to take the SPM BM? Oh, okay. Uh -huh. uh, SPM, BM, as soon as possible. Don't leave it until you're in year five, five of medicine when the amount of information you're learning is huge. Try and do it as soon as possible. So to answer the first question, which is related, if you're in foundation and we know you need to get these SPM and IELTS and MOET exams in order to enter, if you uh, try and avoid taking an exam date for IELTS that clashes with an assessment. So know your assessment dates, they'll be in your timetable. But if you do get a clash, then we will allow you to be absent to do them. If you miss a test, which is say 10% of the assessment, we will transfer that 10% into your exam. So your exam is out of 60 instead of 50. So you will not lose out. Um, likewise, if it happened to occur on an exam day, there is a reset exam for those who failed subjects two weeks later, and you will be allowed to take the reset as your first attempt. So where possible, choose your dates for these exams judiciously. Obviously with SPM, you can't, it's determined by the government. But if we found out that there was an SPM exam that had a significant number of foundation students who wanted to take Bahasa or one of the science subjects to get their B on that day, and we found that we had a foundation assessment on that day, a key one, we might consider moving it if possible. So we will do our best to allow you to do so. Yep. When you get into medicine, missing, because the information is coming at you hard and fast and it's very, very intensive and you're paying a lot of money for your medicine fees, 50,000 a semester, it's advisable not to, uh, to, to avoid such holes in your education. So try and get it done before you go in. All right. The next question is also about SBM, okay? Do you have to pass in BM and Sejarah to continue? History, Sejarah. Do oh. you have to pass in BM and Sejarah, which is history, to continue? Uh, Mr. Yap, are you present at this meeting? That's from admissions, yeah? Yeah, admissions. Uh, uh, okay. I would refer that question yeah, to admissions. That ask. changes from time to time. I'm not being evasive. Email me and I will loop in admissions or ask my admissions colleagues um, because I'm not the one who sets the rules for entry to the degrees and or doing housemanship or qualifying. I just have knowledge of it. But because of the important investment you're making in your, in your education and your future, always get it in writing from the key person, someone in admissions, by email, not by WhatsApp or from someone, a professor in the faculty. So you can say, you sent me this message on this date and you told me this was the rules. In case they say, oh, that's no longer true. You have to do this, this and this. Get it in writing so that there's no risk involved. I'm just telling you the knowledge that I know from, from working in the sector, but don't take me for granted. Get, get it in writing from admissions and or the degrees in question and or the ministry or the medical council because it's important for you for your future. So um, while the answer is, to the best of my knowledge, yes, you need history and mm -hmm. SPM 
Um, these things change from time to time. So just watch this space, but be informed. If you go to a university and get uh, are involved in a session like this with me and Kana and my colleagues from Mission, and someone says, oh, Kanla, no problem, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Get it in writing from their email address. That's yeah. my advice to you. Thank you, Dr. James. Uh, the next one from Selim. Is the foundation course recognized by other universities, which is overseas, other than our partner schools? Okay. So it's recognized by most private universities in Malaysia. We did, for the first time, have students leaving us to do medicine in UM and UKM, because they're now taking private students a limited number. Mm -hmm. We do have some students who went to the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland yep. uh, directly. They had a 3.5 CGPA and they went directly to medicine via Penang Medical School. So they're now in Dublin. Um, I helped them with their application, but we don't have a formal MOU. It's on a case by case basis. However, the attraction of foundation is going to increase in this regard because of the MCO and the serious situation, the much more serious situation that happened in Europe and America. A lot of these universities, um, are quite desperate for international students, which are a key source of revenue for them. And while I don't want you to encourage you to leave IMU, we want you to stay in IMU. Yes. Um, the best way for you to go to a foreign university is by our partner track, because we have a set, uh, we have set guidelines and the set pathway for you. If you choose to go directly to a foreign university, I was speaking to a student yesterday on email who went to Poland to do it. She arranged that on her own. So while we will help you with that as best as possible, um, it's not guaranteed. But obviously, we can help you and we can give you a direct pathway to our local and our partner track. So my recommendation is to take our local or partner track. And then even if you graduate as local and you want to go to Ireland or Australia to be a doctor, you can do your postgraduate there and you can do your professional exams. So doing a local track doesn't preclude you from, from going abroad to be a doctor. Thank you, Dr. James, for the very clear explanation. So the next one is Ms. Tay. Is maths important for chiropractic? Maths is important. Well, I know <laughs> physics is important because yep. the chiropractic professors bet our physics papers because it's all about pressure on bones and forces, etc. So maths is the tool of, of physics. Okay, You can't do physics without maths. You can't do chemistry without physics. And you can't do biology without chemistry. I think Anna will, uh, will agree with that. Yep, sure. So maths is a tool. So if some students take maths, uh, they, they embrace maths one, two, and do statistics because they're very good at maths. And when you leave a maths exam, you pretty much know that you got the right answer. You, I got an A in that because I answered them all and I'm good at maths. When you're in a biology exam or a biosciences exam, you're writing the answer. So you kind of go, I think I answered those fairly well, but I'm not 100% sure. So there are two types of students who engage in maths. Those who are very, very good at maths and use it to maximize their CGPA. They're pretty sure of getting an A. However, they might have weaknesses in biology because their uh, English skills are poor, so that maths will compensate. Then there are those who are very good at biology and maybe chemistry, and they didn't do ad maths or do well in ad maths in either SPM or IGCSE. So you're aiming, hopefully, hopefully you get an A, but you're aiming to get a B or maybe a C plus you can still make it there, okay? But you do need basic maths. I mentioned already that all of the coronavirus data that you see on these websites and all of the, the rates of exposure, the rates of cure, the rates of death, unfortunately, that's all calculus, that's all maths. Patient statistics is all maths. How many people suffer from cancer in the various states mm -hmm. in Malaysia? Dato Lockman, who's our head of research and was the former assistant DG of health in, involved in infectious diseases. He's an expert in maths, but he's also one of the top doctors in Malaysia. So yes, maths is important, but don't, don't be afraid of it, okay? If you're not proficient at maths, we have lots of students who are weak at maths. They manage to make it through and they get a sufficient grade at maths that is not an A, but it doesn't negatively impact their overall CGPA. And some of the buddies might be able to help you with this. And I'm happy to share the buddy list with you if you email me. Okay, Dr. James, you have 10 more minutes. Okay. Uh, let's quickly go through a few more Good questions. Question. Yeah. If forecast papers are going to be considered for the April intake, are the, are the entry requirements still the same? Yeah, that's a very good question. I've been doing some research into yeah. this lately. And um, 
the I did some statistical analysis of last year's intakes. I asked them for their forecast results and their final results. The majority of SPM and IGCSE final results, the grades are higher. Okay, so about 75 forecast results are generally lower for about 75% of schools. It depends on the school. Uh, sorry, they're either the same or uh, higher for the final exam. So forecast is harder, you get a lower grade. However, there seems to be about a 20% of schools, both IGCSE and mainly SPM, where the forecast is sometimes easier. So if we accept, to answer your question, if we accept forecast results, the expectation is that your final will be the same or hopefully higher, but some of them might be lower. So there's a risk if, for example, your forecast, you got the five Bs from medicine, everything is fine on forecast, and then you join us based on forecast results, if the ministry allow, and we're, we're appealing on that behalf. And then unfortunately in your final, you get a C in one of the core science subjects, then you have a problem. You will have to, you will not be qualified to go to medicine, dentistry or pharmacy at that point, regardless of how well you do in foundation. So you will have to do the reset. So there is a risk involved in forecast results. But as I said, from my analysis from last year's intake, intake 75% of forecast, forecast results are either the same or they're slightly lower than the final result. But I can't guarantee that and it's on a school by school basis. Okay, thank you, Dr. James. Next is from Darini about semester exams. Uh, she asked, when are the semester exams throughout the year? Okay, so the typical semesters in foundation, they're about 14 weeks, okay? So we have three, so if you start in February, there's going to be three months, or if you start in April, you're going to have April, May, June, and in the middle of July, is that correct, Kana? You're yes, going to have correct. your exams. Yeah. Then you're going to have a two-week break, and you're going to start semester two in August, another 14 weeks, and you're going to start semester three in November. Yep. So you will be given an academic calendar. If you email me or Kana, we will send you the academic calendar for next year, and you will know exactly when the exams are. And any prospective student, we encourage them to do it because prior to MCO, people traveled and they had vacations or they had to go on cultural events or religious events. So we do give you the academic calendar to help you plan uh, in advance of coming to us. We want to make it as transparent as possible. Um, but we don't have much flexibility in when we hold the exams or extending the exams, because if you take it that it's a one-year course, there's three 40, 14 week semesters, so that's uh, 42 weeks. There's th three exam weeks and there's three um, uh, breaks between the exams and the resets. So we're up to 48. And then Malaysia being so wonderfully multicultural with Hari Raya, Christmas, Deepa Valley and Chinese New Year, we lose four weeks. In my country, there's only one Christmas. So it, we only lose one week for the semester. In Malaysia, Bule, there's four festivals. So we yeah. have to work around that. So we don't have much flexibility in terms of doing it, okay? That's right, Dr. James. Okay, <clears throat> there's two more questions about uh, partner universities, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. Does IMU partner university accept students from FIS uh, yes. to enter their degree courses directly? And <laughs> is there a limit of people available to go to the universities uh, after FIS? Yes, so... Um, uh -huh. There's a limit to the number of partner track places, uh, and you can get that information, or that varies from time to time. Some of the partners, like Galway and Ireland, I believe take 20 students into their medical program. Don't quote me on that. Some of them, like St. George's in London, are very uh, upmarket, and they only take one student. So don't make that your only choice. So it depends. Um, in terms of, we do have students who have applied for direct entry to Cairo in Australia and have a bypass the partner track. However, the advantage of the partner track is that you do your first two years here in Malaysia. You're still relatively young when you finish foundation. Some students in foundation have only just turned 17 and it can quite be it can be a bit intimidating to get on a flight to a foreign country. So if you wait the two years uh, the local track and then go in two years time, you're more mature. If it was my son or daughter, I'd be happier with them going abroad when they were 19 or 20. Also, from an economic point of view, you will pay two years of fees at the local track rate, which are far in excess of the partner track rate. And also, if you decide, actually, no, I don't want to go to Australia or I've changed my mind, 
you can generally generally revert back from the partner track to the local track and compete here and complete here. There might be a, a semester adjustment, but generally so. So our recommendation, this is why we have the partner track. We believe it's the best way to go. If you choose to bypass that, I again reiterate, you're on your own, you have to do your own negotiation, but we'll do our best to support you with that. Okay, Dr. James, there's the last question by Chua. Mm -hmm. The student with minor color deficiency to apply for foundation today and to get the waiver, is it, uh, sorry, uh, to enroll medicine after completing foundation? Okay, great question. Sure. I am severely red, green, colorblind, and I'm a physicist, okay? <laughs> um, I once applied to be an astronaut, and I didn't get the job because I was red, green, colorblind. It's not an issue, okay? Uh, I spoke to this. A, a student asked me that. There is no barring of students with color deficiency in the medical program. However, you need to develop strategies in order to get around this. So if it says all the patients with pink tags give them this injection and all the patients with purple tags give them this injection, you need to have a nurse advise you on that, etc. So I have developed strategies to overcome this this red green um, deficiency, but it's not an issue. Okay. Um, so to, to best of my knowledge, no, it's not a problem. Um, I mean, the, the key thing is having a red green deficiency. Um, but if you're a very empathic, great doctor and a great surgeon, that that's what your parents, oh, that's what your patients. Nobody goes into a doctor's surgery and says, how's your color vision? They say, how are you of being a doctor and can you cure me? But you need to be careful. But it's the same as someone who's wearing spectacles, someone who's short-sighted or long-sighted. If you're severely myopic and you can't see things, you know, very well, um, if, you, if you left your, your spectacles at home that day, it's, I would avoid doing the operations that day. So the spectacles just compensate. So it's just a question of developing strategies. Hey, Dr. James, uh, that's about uh, forecast results I'm from SM and RIS. I do not have my IGCC results, but I would want to apply for foundation today to get the waiver. Is it possible? And uh, the uh, other is, can we apply with forecast today for IGCSE candidates? Uh, I believe so. Admissions yep. can, um, can, can answer that question. But yes, you, you can apply today. But obviously, if you don't, produce the documentation by the set date or the date when you say you'll have them and the fees are not forthcoming, you might lose any deposit that you paid. Uh, that's a question for admissions. Um, but given the strange circumstances with MCO, et cetera, I believe my colleagues, my good colleagues in admissions led by Mr. Yap, who I work closely with, are being reasonably flexible. But, you know, you need to provide the documentation in good time when you have it, okay? So make that inquiry. We're being reasonably flexible. And uh, sometimes students can't get the actual signed transcript from their principal because they're a, they, they did it in another state or they're in Sabah now and they did it in KL. So they physically can't get there, but just get an electronic copy, a provisional copy and then pending you joining foundation, get the final, final, final versions. Don't let it drag. I would also like to remind students that our virtual info day is today until 4 p.m. So you can still join our staff uh, for any other inquiries. Uh, there's another question by Ning. Are there any local subjects in Foundation in Science? Probably she's asking about the curriculum in Foundation in Science. By local, do you mean perhaps some Malayu and history? Uh, uh, local uh, subjects, probably. Yeah, no, uh, in the old... Until about three or four years ago, you used to do uh, the MPU subjects. They were called I can't remember, they were called something else kind of at the time. You used to do those in foundation, but no, they're all homegrown yes. IMU courses. So there's no government-based courses in foundation. They've, they've changed that. Uh, they used to be called MPW, yeah. and they used to be in foundation. Now no more. They're all done in the degree. Yes. So all of the modules in foundation are designed mm -hmm. and by us to maximize your entry and your uh, proficiency of study in our degrees. Yes, thank you, Dr. James. Then Lara is asking, can I apply my with my term exam results instead of trial results? Ooh, okay. Uh -huh. I would have joined the talk to session uh, on the virtual day yes. and ask, ask them that. If you can't get in, uh, note my email address. Let me just... Uh, Click back with my screen showing, Kenna? Yes, Dr. James. Okay, uh -huh. so I will field those questions. Try and talk to the admissions people first. Uh -huh. So if you if you see my email address, James Welch, IMU, etc., just change 
the James Welsh to admissions and then CC me on the email and we'll do our best to answer your questions. Uh, I can answer, but they are they are the oracle. They know the exact details and they have policies for accepting certificates uh, pending final results. Uh, I don't determine this, but I'll support you as best I can. Dr. James, so that is end of our questions. Okay. Uh, so thank you for thank you to all the parents and students, okay, for attending this talk and also for your very interesting questions. Is there something that you want to tell us, Dr. James, before we end? No, up? just great. Thank you for joining and thanks for fantastic questions. Yeah. And uh, I know, hopefully, we're talking about joining a fully face-to-face -face intake in April. Um, the vaccine rolled out, but be rest assured that if that's not the case, hopefully it is, that the intakes that joined us fully online from April last year and have had partial face-to-face -face during the RMCO, but back to fully online now, their average CGPA in the exams and the grades they're getting are, are statistically no different than those face-to-face. -face. So Foundation lends itself to online teaching very well because it has relatively few skills-based activities such as laboratories. So have no fear about your progression grade and getting into your degree um, if you join Foundation and it's online teaching. There's no evidence that it's, it's, it's uh, detrimental to the students. Uh, so, but hopefully we're not talking about that, but just in case, I'm just yes. putting that out there to reassure you, okay? Okay, thank you, Dr. James. Okay. Uh, so with this, I think we will end our talk. So students, please do join us in our uh, virtual open day. Okay, for further information. Thank you, okay. everyone. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time and good questions. Bye. Thank you, everyone.